Welcome to Crucial Conversations. I'm Peter. And I'm Kevin. And Kevin, we are not in a normal place today. No. We're, but we are in an office we've been in before. We are sitting in my pastor's office. And my pastor right now is Pastor Joel Bierman of the St. Louis Seminary, who is currently the interim pastor here at Village Lutheran Church, where I'm a member. Pastor Bierman, thanks for joining us today. It's my pleasure to be with you guys. I mean, it's good that you're here since we're in your office. It'd be kind of weird to... Uh, not really my office. It's kind of like the church's pastoral <laughs> the office. Space, I'm in that space Yeah, right the space now. you currently occupy. Yeah, so. it's a technical theological thing, but it's the way it is. I'm not really the pastor, but I'm yeah. a pastor here. So. Yep, yep. I, while you're here, I'm still going to call you my pastor because I don't want to be without a pastor. I understand. Because that's not a good thing either. You're right. That's so. why I'm here. <laughs> yeah. Well... The reason we invited you on, we asked you to be here, and you, I, I think it's the reason you also graciously agree, because we want to talk about Jesus, which is what Kevin and I like to do mm-hmm. on this podcast. Those of you who have listened for a while know that we tend to really, we try to have a very strong Christological focus. And I, after a couple Bible studies and a couple sermons, hearing you as our interim pastor here, vacancy pastor, I started hearing you saying a lot of the same kinds of things that we tend to say on our podcast. Similar phrases, even um, entire sentences every once in a while. I was like, (laughs) whoa, that's like the same sentence about Jesus that we've spoken. And so I was like, I would, I I said, Kevin, I want to talk to Pastor Bierman, see if he'll Mm. join us on the podcast, because you you two don't know each other. You you and Kevin don't really, haven't conversed. I didn't really know you until this point and yet we're trying to do the same thing it kind of appears and i think that's cool and it's very cool (laughs) to me it's an affirmation of the the power and the strength of what i would term the regular fide the the rule of faith that just runs through the church and holds us together and i'm i'm persuaded of this that when people are really paying attention to what god teaches what the church gives us to believe and to teach there's a continuity there, and there's mm-hmm. a coming together and a coherence. And I even see this, this might be sound scary, but I even see this that transcends even denominational lines, where you see mm-hmm. people who are actually paying attention to the teaching of the church and to orthodox teaching. There's a coherence, and it's, it's, yeah. it's cool. Yeah. So, yeah, I find it really affirming and, and really kind of exhilarating. So we're going to let you talk most of the time. We're just going to try and ask you questions to get you talking about basically how you do what you do. So here's my, here's okay. my first question for you. Tell us about your Christological approach to preaching and teaching, because it's mm. particularly in those two settings that I've heard it. What's your methodology? Do you have a methodology? How do you do what you do? Yeah, methodology is a word that I'm not fond of. Okay. I, I just really, and, and this is strange because I'm graduate level instructor and I'm doing grad work with students who are having to come up with their research methodology. And <laughs> I think, ah, oh, I don't even I don't know. I, I, I just, I think of a topic, you dig in and you talk about it. You know, I don't know. It just kind of happens for me. Um, so my, when it comes to being the Christological thing, it's kind of a no brainer. Everything's about Jesus. Um, he is God's revelation. He's God's reality. He, it's, it's all about him. Hmm. And so if we're not keeping that straight, what's the point? And so to me, maybe it is a bit of a deliberate focus on that singularity of keeping Jesus central because it is easy to get distracted by all the other things. There's so many attendant things. And I think it is helpful to come back to again and again, but wait a minute, what's, where's Jesus in this? What's the Jesus point? What's going on there? And so it's, just, it's almost just a, a, a deliberate, intentional move just to think, wait, where's this going with Jesus? And see, that isn't just a gospel thing. It's a law and gospel thing. Mm. Because when you read the gospels, as we're doing and are going through Luke, in one of the Bible studies we're doing, Jesus says plenty of law stuff. And there's plenty of challenge there. And it's, it's just, and it's fun to just hear Jesus as Jesus talks instead of how we think he should sound or what we think he should do. And you just actually hear him. It's like, he blows your mind all the time. And it's, it's a blast. Now, I know you've heard a lot of sermons, Kevin. I've heard a lot of sermons. You've heard a lot of sermons, mm-hmm. Pastor Bierman, where they, they're they not about Christ. They don't focus on Christ. So there is something you have to do. I'm guessing. I'm, I'm not a pastor. I haven't preached. Yeah. Well, I preached a little bit back in my non-Lutheran days. Um, <laughs> we that's, a whole nother, <laughs> that's a whole other We've actually had an episode or two on that. That's, oh, okay. that's an interesting thing in and of itself. Um, but... but the fact that it doesn't always happen, 
or that right. it maybe even frequently doesn't happen means mm-hmm. there's something you have to do either right. mentally as you're doing it. So walk us through what, yeah. what are some of those things that you do to make sure right. i got to keep this focus. Well, so, so it's my sermon prep is, is pretty formulaic. I follow the same process. You, you study the text, dig into the text, and you do that to the extent you need to exegetically just get what's going on there. And then I still, I'm just very much a fan of goal malady means and kind of going the old, you know, what's what am I what's the goal here of this text? And then what is the problem? And for me, hitting the malady is one of the most significant parts of it. It's not just people are sinners. No, you gotta figure out how they're sinners. Where, what's going on uh-huh. here? And when you start to pin that down, it gets more precise. And then you can start getting to how where where are we going to go to get there then? You know, central mm-hmm. thought, goal malady means helps you to keep the focus. And so part of what I'm doing when I'm working on this is the goal has always got to be getting Christ communicated, getting people challenged to think about what Christ is telling them. It's That's where the Jesus stuff comes in. And see, that's where it just is. It's not something I have to like tell myself to do. It just happens because I know I've been doing it and this is what I do. And yeah. I kind of think it happens now more by rote or by, in, not, I don't want to say intuition because it's not like it's in me inherently, but it is something that has been learned. It's just the process I do and it's just, it comes through. So goal, malady, means. Yes. Um, what talk about the means? You mentioned yeah, the malady. Yeah. How are people centers? What is the means part? Yeah. Of that? So yeah, goal malady means is an old formulaic way of thinking about a text getting into the sermon, and it becomes sort of the the targets and the the parameters within within which you operate. And then from the goal. So the goal is what is it I want to get out of this text and sermon? What is the problem I see in the listeners? What's going on? What are the things they're struggling with? And the means is how does the text or how does God's work and how does the Spirit work to bring people to the goal? Through the means, you know, it's and so you could get like, well, the problem is sin. The means is forgiveness of sins, and the goal is to forget, fear to forgiven. Well, that's pretty simplistic, and there's sometimes <laughs> that works. But the the other critical part then is the text itself. And good preachers, in my opinion, know the text has to be what's going on here, mm-hmm. and so that's what starts to rein you in and give you the kind of the parameters. Because otherwise, you always kind of get too fat and do all kinds of stuff you shouldn't be doing. But if you stay, this is what the text is doing, then you become content. I'll I'll do this because that's what this text is doing and so that's what that's where those three criteria come in so then for me the the goal part is probably where i'm thinking most explicitly about the jesus move and what jesus is doing and this is something i've probably done a little more deliberately since i've been teaching at the sam is just and through some of my grad work and just thinking is i'm more deliberate all the time just talking about jesus mm-hmm. and you know the, the incarnate reality of this man who is god in the flesh because we have a tendency to go to the kind of the Christological thing of, you know, we start doing the from above and, you know, the holy other, he's God and he does God stuff. Oh, yeah. But he's still, <laughs> he's a guy. He's a man. He's a, he's a real dude. And that's what blows your mind is when you think about this man doing these things and what he says as this, the perfect human and what humans are supposed to be. And that's when it, to me, gets really exciting because that's the connections. Because then it's not just a God who's coming and saying, thus saith the Lord, like, okay. But now he's, he's one of us. He's my brother in the flesh. I need to listen because he tells me what it's all about. He shows me what it means to be human. That's, to me, I guess, why I get excited. And maybe that's where the Jesus connection becomes really alive for me is because he is fully human. Well, man, so am I. So I, I need to pay attention and I need to listen and learn. And yeah, he's my savior, but he is also my Lord. And yeah, even my example. And I know that's, mm-hmm. you know, dicey language in some circles. Right? We're, we're okay with that language. Well, okay, me yeah. too. We have, um, a, we have an episode called Act Like a Christian. I'm cool with that. Yeah, so I'm, I'm a big fan of the imitatio Christi, the imitation of Christ. I, I think it's totally legitimate. And it's not at war with or at odds with Christ as Savior. They're absolutely complementary. But see, that's when the Jesus stuff gets really exciting, and especially for preaching, because you're talking to real people about a real man who's also a real Savior. One of the, one of the phrases you've used in Bible study frequently is talking about God's will. So when mm. we start talking about the law, you quickly make that move to, God's will, as opposed to a legalistic. Here's a list I, of things yeah. to do, you, which, which is what we do. <laughs> we do that as well. I was like, oh, "That's great." Ooh, hey, <laughs> we're not the only. This is cool. Actually, I should say Kevin because I learned it from him. So All right. then we do it here, and that's that's kind of yeah, no, generally I'm, how this works. So that's that's another. No, I'm pretty thing. deliberate about that. That's that's something that's kind of one of my axes to grind. I guess is I, I'm very concerned about the antinomian spirit that kind of permeates mm-hmm. a lot of, the, of Christianity and especially our own little corner of Christianity called 
LCMS Lutheranism. And so I, I, I want to alert people to this and push against this. And I think one of the best ways to do that is just to follow what our confessions say. And it's the formula of Concord that says the law is the will of God. It's how things are supposed to work. And when you think about it that way, it, it just puts everything in a whole new light. And so that's where when I'm preaching the law, my goal isn't just to smash people. My goal is to remind them of how God put things together. Now, in the process, they're always going to get smashed because what God expects and what I can do are always vastly apart. Yeah. And I'm always going to find myself falling short. But I still need to remember, this is a good thing that God put together. And learning to do the law doesn't mean I'm succumbing to legalism. It means I'm growing into what God created me to be. And that's pretty good. Yeah. So, so that's an important thing to pause and, and think about or maybe talk about real briefly is that if if Christ is the fulfillment of the law and the law is a revelation of God's will then that really leads us to a really interesting Christological idea mm. right and so could you flesh that out a little bit for us yeah in, in so so and feel free to jump in and supplement because <laughs> I'm not sure exactly where you're going your thoughts are but I'll tell you what I think about that when Christ says that he is the end of the law it's key he's using the word talos in Greek which to me is hugely significant because in in Greek the whole idea of talos is not that's it we're over Tell us is this is where we're headed. This is what it's all about. This is the, the, the aim, the target. So when Jesus says, I am the tell us of the law, he's not saying he's eradicating it. He's saying it all comes together in him. And he is the, the culmination of it. So in other words, he embodies the perfect fulfillment of doing God's will. He is the full perfect human. He captures it all. And so that and that's and that sheds light on when Jesus says, not one jot, not one tittle is going to drop from the law. Mm -hmm. Every little bit of it. Why? Because I'm fulfilling all of it. And because it's all God's good will. So the goal is not to get rid of the law. Now, see, the contrast in is with Paul, but we'll go to him later. <laughs> because Paul will sometimes talk in a very dismissive way about the law, just like Luther will. And you have to say, well, what's going on there? And there it's helpful to remember what they're talking about is the condemning aspect of the law. It's my opinion. And it's not the, don't have to worry about it. It's, it's, it's all different. Because see now, and maybe where you're going with some of this too, and I'll just, maybe if I'm wrong, tell me it. But <laughs> if I am in Christ through faith, I'm caught up into his fulfillment. I have already fulfilled the law in his justification and in his righteousness. And so then, in a sense, me learning to do the law and learning to live in a Christ-like way is just kind of, as people have said, getting used to my justification or living into that reality. And so you have these two things going on at once, and it's a little bit of the eschatological now, not yet. Right now, I am fully in Christ, fully a law keeper, and I'm not yet, and I'm working on it. And it's not burdensome. And it's not a drag. And it's not like, oh, woe is me. I've got to try to beat this dumb vice. No, I'm going to do this because this is good to do. And it's right what God calls me to do. And I don't have to worry about, am I doing this to earn salvation? Of course not. Am I doing this to get brownie points from God? No. Why, am I, why are you doing it? Because that's who I am. And it's what God calls me to be. And I know his grace. And why wouldn't I? You see, it just, it just puts a whole new flavor on stuff. And you're still doing right things and you're working at it and it's hard work sometimes, but it just feels different. Uh, so so I, I, like, I like the, I really like the in crystal language from Paul. I, I really think the more I, I study this and teach on it, that it's, it's an important way to talk about Paul's writing. It is. It's um, huge for him. It's, it's such a, a prevailing metaphor it is. for him. Yep. Um, and, and then to see that to be in Christ is to be in God's will. Right. And then you, you quoted First John, which is always the correct thing to do, <laughs> which is to say that the law is not burdensome. You know, mm. um, this, the command is not burdensome. surprised it took us this long to get to right. John. <laughs> I mean, Wait. usually John's in the first five okay. minutes. Right. Right. Just, right. yeah. um, but, but just the idea that, that to be in the will of God is to be in Christ. Yeah. And I'm learning to live in that reality. That's it. That's that's so important and i think some people miss that when they want to apply a text to our lives they don't apply it through christ okay they just yeah. try to apply like this kind of concept to improving our lives so how do we do that in a christological way mm. to really preach the text with a, a, a real focus on Christ yeah. and kind of a third use of the law. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Preach, read the text, listen All to it. For me as <laughs> yeah. a lay person where I'm not preaching or anything. Right. The, yeah. I think part of it comes, maybe part of the problem is we hear 
in Christ and we immediately go to justification thoughts and we and we stop there and so we were and that's I'm not minimizing that that is the big move of course you know to be in Christ forgiven justified right with God oh that's so good but you're you're quite right to be in Christ is is a whole person thing and so I'm fully caught up into him and so the en Christo thing is not just justified forgiven because I have his righteousness it also means it's my identity that I'm growing into. And so I think, and see what's what's maddening here a little bit is because we end up giving like pointers for life or, you know, how to live and guidance, which starts to sound like something a Buddhist could say mm-hmm. or a Stoic could say. And you, people start saying, well, wait a minute, I heard that from a Stoic, that can't be Christian. No, you can't do that. Because you see, God's truth is God's truth. And what's actually going on here is God's hardwired law that's in the creation, just functioning, gets stub- gets discovered by other people. You know, why are we surprised by that? Aristotle figures it out. Buddha stumbles on some of the truth. The Stoics get it. Marcus Aurelius figures some stuff out. Great. And so when they figure it out and they say it right, we can learn from that. It doesn't deny our Christianity or our uniqueness, but what it does is it helps us realize that Christ is all in all and doing everything in him is doing God's law well. And there are things to learn and things to practice along that process. And so I think the uniquely Christian aspect is that it's always grounded in justification by grace through faith in Christ alone. We know that. We celebrate that. That's who we are. And even though I, though I don't say that at every turn, and I don't have to put that as a caveat behind every word of the law, it's what's always implicit. And that's what allows us as Christians to hear and to respond and to do the law with a, just a different attitude. Or, or, and the, see, this is the problem. Every Aristotelian, every Buddhist, and every Stoic always has the same goal, self-improvement make mm-hmm. myself more what I need to be. And it's always focused on the, the character they're gonna build in themselves or the, the um, freedom from distress they're gonna build in themselves or the, the, the level of humanity they're hoping to reach for their own benefit, yeah. for their own self-congratulation, I did this. And for the Christian, it's completely reversed because that's all done. I'm all I can possibly be in Christ already. And so my life is not for my self-improvement. It's simply for my self-giving for the sake of the other. And that changes the complete focus of everything I'm doing. So maybe that's the Christological aspect too, is learning to see with Christ-like eyes, which is never internally focused on how well I'm doing, but on how well I'm serving. It's always focused out. I don't know if that fits with what you're thinking, but those are just some of the thoughts that come to my mind. So... Earlier, in, when you were kind of introducing all this, you mentioned the regular fide. Yeah. And and then we kind of moved to... Kind Did of we a define regular fide? Right. So let's let's talk a little bit how that that kind of intersects with our hermeneutic and, and maybe mm. our material principle a little bit. We generally try and define and, terms. We've got right. all so sorts of people listening. Good. So we have a lot of, a lot of things <laughs> floating around we here do. that I think we need to that's, get that's to. That's fine. So, regular fidei is this, it's a Latin phrase, and it just simply means literally rule of faith. But it's a catchphrase, and there are several other parallels you can use for it. But it's the phrase that we use to say, this is essentially the body of doctrine, or the, the truth as it's been handed down. Uh, Paul uses an interesting term quite frequently, uh, or related ideas of this idea, in Greek it's paradosis, which is literally to hand over. Or hand across, and the most the most famous passage that most Lutherans know about this is in First Corinthians eleven. Yeah, okay. exactly. It's a vital so, one. Yeah, that which what which was handed to me. Yeah, that which okay. yes, and then in First Corinthians fifteen, he makes the same move. Exactly, that which was given to me, I pass on to you right. of first importance. Yep. And it's what's fascinating is when you actually start watching for this, like so many things, you see it all over the place. <laughs> it just pops up again and again and again. And so what you what you begin to recognize is, well, what is Paul talking about? Well, what he's talking about is that already in the time of Paul, already in this first, second generation of the Christian faith, already there is a deposit of faith, another phrase for this, that is set. This is what we believe. Mm-hmm. This is what we confess. This is what we know. And it's not just 18 points on a page of doctrinal propositions. It goes to how we worship, how we live, how we hang out with each other, how we eat, how we spend our money. All of it's getting involved. And that's why I see for Paul, there's not a distinction in his letters between doctrine and ethics. It just runs together. And this is where one of my 
influential guys, not Lutheran, Stanley Hauerwas has helped me because he says all the time, there is the goal is to remove the and. Doctrine and ethics, no, it all runs together. What we are, what we believe, what we do, what we confess, it all runs together. And this is really helpful here. Now, how does this tie back to Christology? Because if I'm going to confess these truths about Jesus, I live these truths about Jesus. And here's the really cool Christological move. What is the source of the paradosis? It's not the apostles sitting around cooking up a bunch of theological points. It's Jesus. It's what he did. And so why do we confess that Jesus is true God and true man in one person? Because that's what he was. They, the disciples watched him in action and they, they can, can come to no other conclusion. He's really a man. He's doing God stuff. He's a God man. That's what we have to say. <laughs> and so they confess it because that's what's there. And see, it's the same thing with eschatology. It's the same thing with just about every move we make in our biblical understanding or in our regular fide. It's all tying back to Jesus. And it's all tying back to this is just how things are. And that's kind of cool. Do you have um, a place or a couple places in Scripture you go to back that up? Sure. To say, to say this is how to read Scripture. I read it this way because... Scripture teaches me, and here's where it teaches yeah, me and to read it that way. This is where I'm, you, you invoked John, but I'm, I'm a Paul guy. I'm up and down. I just, I just, Ooh, I just, fight, fight. Yeah, oh, okay. yeah, yeah. They, they fight with each other all the time. No, no I, I want you two to fight. Oh, yeah, yeah, so that's what I was fight. going for. Oh, yeah, so let's well, see. That could happen, too. If John wins, don't worry. <laughs> no, I disagree on that one. Um, does John live longer than Paul? Well, that he does. Doesn't. There's five books that begin the, God, the Bible. And they're all written by Moses. And there are five books that end the Bible. And they're all written by John. Uh, fair enough. <laughs> fair enough. You're, yeah, that's fair. But it, in between, there's a lot of good stuff going on. <laughs> okay, so let's and go. And John gets his gospel, too. So Since I, I, you're I, the yeah. guest, we're going to allow you right, to make right, the move yeah. to we'll Paul. Please, Paul please do. All right. So... I, I, I see Paul making this move all the time. And this is, and this is the 1 Corinthians 11, it's 1 Corinthians 15. It's just about every letter he writes. It's, I'm giving you what I was given. And so in other words, he's bound by this paradosis. He's bound by what's been handed over to him. He doesn't have liberty to do what he wants. Mm -hmm. And he even says in another place, you know, what I teach, what are we teaching all the churches? See, it's just all over the place. And even in Romans, he invokes this. He hasn't been to Rome. He's never been there. He hasn't found any of those churches, but he reminds them of what they've been given. And mm -hmm. see, it's common. Everybody's functioning with this. It's just there. Now, where the critics come in is they say, well, then tell me what it is. Write, write it down. No, I'm not going to. <laughs> you know, there are things that we can all agree on, but things, when you start getting down the list, you know, you know, what, is that paradosis or not? It just gets, it admittedly gets fuzzy, but it's there and it's functioning. Okay, so if we're going to look at Paul and the paradosis, we have this weird reality in Galatians, though, where mm. he actually says the opposite. Mm. Go ahead. My gospel is not something I learned from men. Okay. Yeah. yeah right? Yeah. So yeah. what do we do with that? Yeah. And I would think... And, and the reason this is important is okay. because Galatians is kind of important for Lutheran theology. Yeah, kind of. <laughs> Especially what he leads <laughs> yeah, up to, you know. right? Right, right, right. And I would have to do some digging because I haven't looked at that exact verse recently or, you know, right off. But my immediate reaction right off it ends would be to say, how is she defining men? What's he mean by anthropoi there, or mm -hmm. anthropon, whatever the, the tense it is, or whatever, I mean, case, not, case thank you. <laughs> Just drawing a blank on my grammar terms. Whatever case it is. So I'm wondering how he's using anthropos. And my mm -hmm. guess is he's doing it, kind of the same move he'll make with flesh. You know, sometimes what flesh means is human body. But for Paul, usually what flesh means is sin, sinful self. Mm -hmm. And so when he's talking about men, I don't think he's meaning literally voices talking all, you know, because how else do you learn? You learn through other men. He's really getting at men as opposed to God. Sort of like the psalmist who says men do their things, king, kings do their things, people believe in princes and trusting horses, but we believe in the Lord our God. There's the contrast. Are you doing mm -hmm. man's way or God's way? And I think mm -hmm. that's the move Paul's making. So, and so then what he says is that, that his gospel is actually directly from Christ. Uh-huh. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so it's kind of what you're getting at with the like, regular fide is that where did this come from? Even if Paul learned this through other human mouth right. or through another human teacher, what he's saying is the gospel I'm preaching was this is what Jesus said and did. That's exactly right. right? It's from Christ. It's from but Christ. it comes through his church. Right. And see, this is why, now we'll go to ecclesiology, because what is the church? The body of Christ. Mm -hmm. And what's the difference between the church and Christ? Not much. And, you know, I see that's when you start talking about that being en Christo as this metaphor. Yeah, but it's even more than metaphor. It starts to become 
tangible reality, that I am in Christ in a way that is more than just picture or symbol. It's a, it's a reality. So what happens then when I can't be at church? Well, when you can't be at church, you're still <laughs> church, and you're still part of the church, and you still live that way, and you find very few excuses why you can't be at church. You know, that's why it's important for the gathering together. That's why it's important that we are in Christ in church and celebrating the sacrament and hearing his word, and you don't live apart from that. The church is who you are, and it's the old adage which is exactly accurate. He would have God as his father, must have the church as his mother, and we don't poo-poo it, and we don't minimize it. We need to be there. Yeah, that's another whole topic. That is and I have a few thoughts on that one too. But um, we actually you know. do need to have a couple episodes on ecclesiology. Well, that's, oh, that is yeah. So we're yeah. we're going to get into that on this podcast eventually, yeah. especially in regards to the metaverse and all the fun stuff happening oh, over, over there too. So you know, so the back to your point, Kevin is so the paradosis is absolutely grounded in Christ, and even though it comes through man and it comes through different written texts, it's all about Christ. And see, that's what I, I I'm prepping. I was just working when you guys came in, wrapping up my sermon for this Sunday, and I'm using the epistle reading from 1 Corinthians 15, which is kind of delightful. We get a little resurrection preview, you know, in Epiphany, and we have a little mm-hmm. Easter preseason, you know, debut. But it's, it's a great text because it's all about Jesus. And even though, see, Paul's saying, I heard this from this person, I got this, and these are the witnesses, but see, what are they all doing? They're witnesses to Jesus' resurrection. Jesus drives it all, mm. and it's all about him. And so what brings Paul to faith? It's his face-to-face encounter with Jesus, the resurrected Christ. Bam! Jesus says, Paul, why are you persecuting me? He's persecuting the church, but he's persecuting me. And so everything changes for Paul because he knows it's true. And so even though the paradosis is fine-tuned for him, filled out, fleshed out by all the conversations he has with the apostles and everybody else, it's all about Jesus. Okay, so we've been talking a lot, and we didn't get to material principle yet. I want to get there. Okay, good. But, yeah, um, fine. But, but before we get there, I just want to pause for a second and let everyone take a deep breath. Uh, We're doing a lot of heady theology and a lot of sermon prep and Bible study prep. Mm. But part of the job of a pastor is to go to someone's house and sit with them. Amen. And and sometimes they're going through stuff that they really can't even process. Correct. So how does a Christological view of everything that Mm. we're talking about... How does that play out in soul care, yeah. in pastoral yeah. care? Yeah. When you when you walk into someone's house, you know, as the pastor who mm-hmm. happens to be there at the time, or a hospital room if you're allowed in these days, you know, wherever. Yeah. Or you see somebody that you know in the grocery store. Hey, pastor, I need to. Yeah. Need to talk well, see, to that's why I'm a sem prof. I don't have to deal with that. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> that's exactly. <exciting. laughs> No, I'll no. See you in class. <laughs> right, you still have to teach it, though. Yeah, I know. No, the, this is the part of pastoral care that's just so enriching and so humbling that you get to be the voice and you get to be the one who brings Christ to people. And so you're right. The the heady theological conversation, it's fun. I, I, I will read it. I'll be the first to admit this. I love it. I, I thrive on it. Enjoy it. Could do it for hours on end. But the, when it really comes down to it is when you walk into the room, the ICU or in somebody's home, and when it really comes down is when you know this is it. They're in their last, their last hours, their last minutes. And you know it. And they know it. And it's all real. And I have said that so many times to people. I said, this is when it's all real. We're not just talking about ideas and propositions and fighting over different doctrinal things. This is real. Jesus came and lived and died for you. You are in him because baptism claims you. You belong to Christ. And I have said that to people countless times. Your baptism is real. You were claimed. Nothing's going to change that because God has made his claim. And because Christ has risen, you know this. And see, that's where the, the real comfort of being in Christ kicks in. And that's just, this is the real power of preaching. It's not just turning the great phrase and getting the cool parallelism that pulls it all together. That's fun. I mean, from a literary construction part, and I delight in that too, even though I don't do it well all the time. I try. But the, the real power in preaching is bringing Jesus to the person. And, the, and so that every person in the pew is thinking, it's for me. It's the pro me thing. It's for me. And this is when it matters. Because see, all the ethereal stuff doesn't matter at all when it comes down to it. What matters is that the person knows that Christ has died for them, that they are in Christ. And it's utterly real. And it's utterly simple. And you don't have to have all the cerebral stuff going on. It's to be in Christ. And that's the power of it. And and so when when we say... Christ is for you, we're saying God is for you. Absolutely. And and God's will, you know, is is now 
we know what that will is for yeah. you, right? And and just I mean I think that's so ridiculously missing in a lot of our world's thinking right now. Mm-hmm. You know, is a lot of people don't know who God is, they don't know where he is, they right. don't know what he's up to, but we actually know his will. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And and that's where this Christological, you know, not just hermeneutic, well, that's a big fancy word, but when we sit down and open the scriptures and we're we're reading the revelation of God in Christ Jesus, we're we're, we're understanding who God is and the Spirit's teaching us to believe this truth about him in Christ. That's right. And and then that empowers us to teach our children this. That empowers us to to share this with one another and empowers us to, well, first of all, to believe it ourselves, that the Spirit works that in us. But then it also allows us to walk into this world yeah, with with this amazing Christological, Christocentric, you know, view of the world right. to share. Right. And which, it, which is powerful, right? Enormously. And it is all about Jesus. And see, this, this speaks to one of the questions I get all the time from students and from parishioners. Oh, the world is becoming hostile to Christianity. Nobody cares about God anymore. You tell them Jesus loves them, they don't care. What are we going to do? How do we reach this world? Well, the answer is, it's Jesus, obviously. And it is always about Jesus. And so, and here's where this thing kind of ties back in again. Because you see, what everybody does care about out there is a meaningful, significant, purposeful life. They don't want to waste their lives. They want to matter. And they might party on the weekends, but they're doing it because it it's fun, but when it gets down to it, they want to do something that counts. They don't want to just waste their life. And if they don't, and they're not able to figure out what matters, they end up purposeless. And that's why the suicide rate keeps creeping up because people are realizing um, Sartre is right. You know, Camus is right. It's just a game. It's, it's, a, it's a waste. So what we can bring to people is we say, you know, you want to know what it's all about? The creator knows what it's all about. And you will never get it until you understand that. And if you want to know what the creator is all about, Jesus tells you. And so what we do is we have the audacious move of simply talking about Jesus and declaring his reality and telling people, this is what matters. This is what counts. Jesus said this. He rose from the dead. You need to listen to him. And then people can blow us off and reject and ridicule. do not matter. This is what we declare. And then we trust the spirit to do his thing. And he does. I have a question. <laughs> Kevin and I were both going to talk at the same time, so um, it, go, it goes along with that. One, another phrase that that you used in Bible study about a month ago now, you said seeing this through the lens of Christ. Okay. Which that was actually either the first or second episode that Kevin and I recorded of this podcast was titled "The Lens of Christ." So oh. That was that was one of those. Yeah, we got to talk. To <laughs> but what I mean, we're kind of doing it now. Hopefully, mm-hmm. that's kind of the goal of this but how do you teach somebody intentionally Mm. to see not just scripture through the lens of christ but everything around them now i'll preface this with saying i've heard you doing it in bible study because but i think it's because i know that's what you're doing but not everybody understands that that's what's going on or or gets it how do you intentionally teach that that the people don't know what's going on is probably just fine because, see, it's, it's happening anyway. <laughs> it's, and, and I guess, what, and you're, I know you're giving me a softball to smack, but uh, I No, this is a hard too. question because we're yeah. trying to do it here. We're trying to figure well, out what yeah. you're trying to tell and us. Well, yeah, and I guess the answer is, and you guys kind of already know this, it, it's through formation, which is one of my big words as well, which means it takes time and it takes mm. consistent commitment. And it happens. You already brought up with my family and my children. That's where it happens. Mm -hmm. And so it happens when mom and dad live it and believe it. And then their kids see it going on. Uh, I've been saying this for a long time, but I'm convinced that most parenting failures don't have to do with lack of discipline or things like that. They have to do with inconsistency. And Mm -hmm. it's when mom and dad are saying this, but the kids see the reality. Then they know it's not real. And so the, the key is the consistency. So if I say that Jesus is the center of my life, but I don't go to the church, he's not the center of your life. And if I say that this is what really matters, but I do go to church, but I never open my mouth and I don't sing the liturgy because I think I, I don't sing hymns because I get a little embarrassed, then you're not really invested. And so it's the consistency. And so it's the utter consistency. So mom and dad don't have to, don't have to be paragons of virtue or get it all right, but they need to be consistent. And I, I see this playing out all the time. I saw it when I was a parish pastor. I see it you know, all the times. Kids who usually 
go bad, you say, well, what's going on there? I know everybody has their own ability to say, do wrong, but parenting has a lot to do with this. And the best parenting is that consistent, here's what's going on. So if I want to instill a Christological worldview and a Christological lens in somebody, and I do, I mean, I want that in my kids, I want it in my grandkids, I want it in my parishioners, I'm gonna be deliberate about modeling it myself. Mm -hmm. I'm going to say these things, but I better back it up with how I live. And I need to make sure that how I treat others, how I interact with others is consistent. Now, am I perfect? No, no, no. Not even close. But even my imperfection, I deal with that in a Christological way by saying, I messed up, mm -hmm. and I need God's grace. And I live with that uh, kind of apparent thing of the, my reliance on God's grace. Consistently so not, repenting is actually yeah, a good thing. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. That's what I'm just trying to say here. So I'm not saying you have to be perfect or the imitatio Christi means, oh, I've arrived. No, you haven't. No, one, you won't. But you you get it and you, you're consistent about these are the things that matter. That's what imprints it. And that's why one of the things I, I think is really important is that we focus on the things that we are responsible for. My family, my congregation, with the world out there, whew, man, I'm not responsible for that entirely, but I've got enough to do with my family and my church. Let's zero in on that and accomplish that. So the process of creating a Christological lens takes, oh, I don't know, 15, 20, 25 years, you know? But that was, <laughs> it's, that was it's, part of my question because <laughs> Kevin will do this in Bible study when, when we're at work or the various Bible studies. You've done it in Bible study where you'll ask a question and everybody in the room knows the answer is Jesus mm -hmm. some way. But we also know just saying Jesus isn't the answer you're looking for. And you'll both say like, guys, you know this. You're well catechized. You've learned this. You've heard this. But my mind is a complete blank. I'm like, but I don't know how to say it. And I'm trying to figure out what is that? Is yeah. it is it my own sinful nature that does that? Is it lack of consistency? Is it just, look, this is the human state. you got to be here learning more right. for that to stop happening. Right. It's like, I'm like... Oh, he asked that exactly the same way Kevin does, and I don't know his answer either. <laughs> like, I know he's doing something, but I, oh, I, think I, I can't just say book, Jesus. To be honest. That's, I think that's, it has a lot to do with it. It has a lot to do with it. So I want to ask one more question. We're kind of getting short on time, but I want to ask one more question, and it might seem like a strange question, but it's not. Okay, maybe it is, but... We talk about the material principles. The answer is principle. Jesus. Yes. Well, it's not. That's the funny thing. We talk <laughs> oh, there's about an answer before you even ask. Yeah, that's right. That's the best kind of question. <laughs> so there's material principle and yeah. formal principle. Okay, you come back to that. Okay, good. Okay. Yeah. So these are theological terms or ideas that we talk kind of about how churches believe, what they believe, those kind of things. So our material principle, our formal principle are not Jesus, mm. right? That's fair. So, so how do we, first of all, there's, there's two questions here. One is... How does our formal and material principles point us to Christ, even though they're not uh -huh. Christ himself? Uh -huh. And how, how is, are those Christological? Yeah. And then the second thing is, you just said, be consistent. Uh -huh. What happens when someone confesses a material principle, but lives and believes mm. inconsistently with yeah. it? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, good. Well, let's do the last one first. And so if somebody's confessing the material principle, and our material principle is going to be the scriptures themselves and uh and i'm gonna get my distinctions right here formal principle is gonna be scriptures themselves okay right? and then the material principle is gonna be ac4 yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. Justification. yeah, okay. yeah. All right. exactly. and so yeah i'll get to that in a minute yeah um, <laughs> so if somebody's confessing one thing and doing something another thing it obviously undercuts everything this gets back to my invoking howard earlier of getting rid of the and doctrine mm -hmm. and ethics mm -hmm. means if your ethics and by ethics, I'm not talking about fuzzy gray area, hard questions. I'm talking about the way you function, your behavior, how you live, how you see life. If your ethic doesn't match your doctrine, your doctrine's suspect. And it's, in fact, it's invalidated. And I, I hear people, you know, don't worry about our practice. Our practice is a little bit, in, you know, avant-garde, avant but our doctrine's fine. No, it's not, because <laughs> your, your doctrine is your practice. And if you're doing funny things out here, that's what your, that's what your doctrine is. So you can't play that game. So that I, I that's clear cut. Now, on the formal and material principle, and you're right, it's not Jesus per se. But see, this starts to show the shortcoming of even those that whole terminology and that way of thinking, which is um, kind of Meyer's contribution to our whole LCMS mm -hmm. world. Mm -hmm. and, and to my knowledge, he's the one who kind of 
created that baby and mm-hmm. kind of runs with it. Kind of runs with it, yeah. And we've, yeah. yeah, he runs with it big time. Mm-hmm. And a lot of people have grabbed onto it. And Even it's Don Lutherans have grabbed onto it and said, hey, this is helpful. Yeah, and it well, is helpful. He yeah. kind of wrote a whole book about it. So yes, he, he did. did. I have <laughs> that did. book. That's, a, that's a fun And book. one of our parishioners here has had a lot to do with that book yeah. and its edit- editions yeah. that have come yeah. out yeah. since. Uh-huh. And so, Religious Bodies of America, if yeah, anybody's yeah, wondering. Yeah, Effie Meyer, we're that's to. what we're talking about. Yeah. M A Y E R. So, that's the right spelling of that one. There's so many Myers. I think that's, I don't know. I, think, that, I think that's correct. I think it is. I think yeah. it's Vowels don't matter. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> someone will figure it out. So, um, his his work is helpful because, see, that, 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 uh, framework or that paradigm is really useful in sorting out what drives you, what makes you different from someone else. So you can think, oh, so Roman Catholics have this formal material principle, Baptists have this, and it's just helpful. Sometimes it's not as useful because evangelicals claim the same ones we have, but they, right. So and that's where it starts to break down. Right. So this, this is kind of the point then, Yeah. is that when we say our material principle is justification by grace through faith because of Christ, we're... We're meaning that in a Christological sense. That's right. Whereas other people can say the exact same words, but not necessarily have the same Christological focus. That's right. And I I think what I'm trying to get at quickly is you can see this in preaching. Yes. When you listen to somebody preach long enough, you learn what their actual material principle is. That's very true. Mm -hmm. And I think what we're getting at in, in this is... Let's learn to read the Bible. Let's learn to teach the Bible. Let's believe the Bible in a true Christological sense in line with our material principle so that 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 means naturally when I open the text of Scripture, I'm going to read it Christologically because I've been practicing that. That's right. Okay. No, that, that, I'm totally with you on that. And that's something maybe I just kind of take for granted, but yeah, shouldn't. Yeah, I think and that's... Yeah, you're right. But I think that's so huge. It we is We talk huge. about Lutheran shortcuts on the podcast yeah. sometimes, and one of our goals is to fill in the gaps between right. the shortcuts. Well, there like, are a lot of those. Let's, let's, let's fill in all those steps because you're right. it's the whole... Yeah, Jesus saves, baptism saves. Okay, there's actually a lot that goes in yes, between to get you there. Right. Let's fill it in. So that's kind of what Kevin's doing here. Is like, and I appreciate Fill your, in the middle. <laughs> yes, and I really appreciate, Kevin, your observation about the preaching reveals this. And that's why people will say, you know, I was going to this non-denominational church or whatever, and they preach Jesus, but it, it just feels different. Right, yeah. yeah. And they know it. They're picking up something. Yeah. And what yeah, they're picking right. up is there's actually a different driving material principle. That's right. It really is. That's because the they don't right. really center everything on an AC4, justification by grace through faith in Christ. They're not really doing that. Right. They might say it, that's not what's happening. Which is the, and I know we're out of time, but 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 this is the other side of, of Christological, is not just saying Jesus a lot. <laughs> yeah, that you may have that. And, and so, and this is something you know, you've, you've brought up many times already in what you've been talking about, but but who he is and what he did. A, a, exactly right. right. Yeah, like yeah. It's not. It's not. Down. It's not the Isaac Bruce calling out Jesus as your right. car is rolling right. over. Exactly. He was, no, you saved me. <laughs> I, I never forget that story. It was. It's ancient. You were all young, but I'll never forget that story. Was, and so, Jesus. There's the magic word. Right. No, no, no. Yeah. It's who he is and all that he did, and and that's what's so delightful is just knowing that Jesus, and you never get tired of that. I don't know that we can do any better than that. You don't get tired of that. Well, that's like because for all of eternity. That, <laughs> to, to use our, our tagline as we wrap it up, that is the crucial conversation. Yeah. That conversation about Jesus and, and who he is. So we are at the end of our time. Thank you, Pastor Bierman, so much for yes. joining us. It's been a delight. A fantastic conversation. Really enjoyed it. Hopefully it was useful, useful to our listeners. If you have any questions, you guys know the email, questions at crucialproductions.org. That actually is productions, not conversations. Oh, okay. I did right. that correctly. I saw that look. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, or fill out the form, crucialproductions.org. Ask a question. You can fill that out. That'll send questions in, too. If you have questions for me and Kevin, if you have questions for Pastor Bierman, send this to us, and I'll ask him on a Sunday morning during Bible study or something. Perfect. Hey, I got a question for you. You know, I always like taking up extra time in Bible study, I always right? enjoy that, too, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, thank you for joining us. Thank you all for listening. We will see you next time. See you.